Hello and welcome to this week's live. And today I'm actually live from Mexico and hence the change in times from 6 p.m. Central European time to 6 p.m. Cholula time. Um, simply put, I had a number of things that I had to do during the day today um, in preparation for the Polybot conference. And 6 p.m. Central European time is 11 a.m. here in Mexico. And so it wasn't possible for me to be around for that. I had to go and uh, have some meetings and uh, plan things for the opening ceremony for the Polywood Conference. We've got some really nice ideas uh, to welcome people to Mexico, ready to celebrate the local languages and cultures of this beautiful country. And so, yeah, Anya, uh, Anya and I and the rest of the, the teams at Zaloa Languages here in Mexico and the Polyglot Conference and uh, as well as the Langfest uh, and uh, the Lingua Cultura experience and you talk teams uh, as partners. We're very excited to be able to offer lots and lots of cool events during the time here in Mexico and um, some of our sponsors. Uh, I've got some really nice things uh, planned as well. So um, I've been busy uh, sorting things out, making things, making sure things are in order for all of that for um, our sponsors at uh, italki and uh, the teacher self, Michelle Thomas, and uh, as well as Asimil, Clothes Master, and the Social Element. And so all of those sponsors of the conference uh, have been putting things together. So it's meant being here has been a great opportunity to, to start uh, really uh, hit the ground running and be prepared for everyone arriving into Cholula. So yes, that's why I am here at this time and not um, earlier as I usually am. And it probably will be the same thing um, next week. I will see if I can make my usual 6 p.m. Uh, Central European time, then I will do my best, but I may need to make it the same for next week too. Uh, obviously, the week after, I won't be around to be live because um, that will be restarting things for the conference, and so that will be quite challenging to uh, to run a conference and be live online as well. Uh, so without any further ado, I did want to... Um, to welcome those of you who have been able to join. I appreciate that um, my intention to, to have this live session uh, earlier didn't work out at the same time, so it may affect uh, how many of you could actually make it to join me live. Um, and I hope that those of you watching this afterwards enjoy the, the recording. So I've been here in Mexico now for, um, a couple of days and uh, one of the things that's, that really strikes me about being uh, back in Cholula and speaking to the locals as I have been uh, when I've been walking around the town is just how welcoming everybody is, uh, how they are very open and very happy to share uh, things that are important to them in their lives, uh, particularly topics to do with their indigeneity and stories of language loss in their families. And for indigenous peoples around the world, um, this is a, you know, really personal journey and every ind indigenous community, in fact, any every indigenous individual will have a different uh, story to tell. And I just, I'm never going to take for granted the, the the the willingness of people here that I've met and how um, how happy they are to to connect. And it just has shown me this week, and I I posted something on Twitter where I I spoke to uh, a guy who was selling coconut milk and the coconuts uh, just downtown uh, in Cholula uh, called Alfonso. And obviously, I mean, I, I look fairly foreign in this part of the world. So people 
will often ask me what I'm doing here and, and you know what I think of it and all that kind of stuff. And, and my my experience of Mexico has been super super positive. I absolutely adore uh, the place and think the people are wonderful. And uh, in fact, it's one of my favorite countries in terms of how welcoming the the local community really is. Um, and so I was, t- I was telling him about the conference and celebrating Mexico and its cultures and languages and that we've got this event going on at the end of the month. And I said, you know, that we've got the, the course as well for the Nahuatl language. And as, as that's the, the local indigenous language here uh, in this part of Mexico. And he just all of a sudden opened up about his own family and um, and how he'd lost the language and thought that was a shame. And this is a story that I've not just heard on this trip, um, but also from other people here, where there is a real sense from a number of Mexicans I've spoken to. I mean, I've, obviously, it's it's a subjective view, but I really get the, the feeling of, you know, when you talk on this topic, it's a living memory of, oh, the grandparents wrote this, or parents even, and didn't pass it on, and what a shame it was that they didn't. And it's quite, it's, it's, it's quite interesting because it's, um, it's something that I think other communities around the world will be able to identify with. And you know, reclaiming um, an indigenous endangered or vun- <clears throat> sorry, or vulnerable language or heritage like in particular. I mean, it, it doesn't even need to be indigenous, endangered or vulnerable. It can just be a, a heritage language that your family once spoke or in living memory. And you know that the stop in that was due to a social pressure, the dominance of another, language or culture over the the one that, that wasn't passed down to you and the can conf- you can feel um a sense of something missing kind of like if you imagine a, a huge jigsaw jigsaw puzzle right and you're, you're missing some pieces a part of the sky a part of the landscape a building is missing from that jigsaw puzzle what learning these languages does and giving them back and what it does for you on a personal level is it helps you to to find those pieces of the jigsaw and to start putting them back in so that you get a fuller picture and sense of of what it is you're seeing and I know many people who have felt that that type of feeling who have reclaimed these languages. And it's one of the things that I feel about myself and about my own linguistic rediscovery of heritage language. And, and so I, I know the power of this and, and this is one of the reasons why I believe in it. So, so fervently, so, so fully and why I am extremely passionate about wanting to support uh, and and help encourage a positive mindset towards these languages in particular um but also generally speaking um i think that reclaiming language particularly languages where some people in the wider community won't see the reason why they went to the need and not everyone will and not even everyone needs to um in fact even within a family uh two siblings may have very different feelings about their own identity and this is why i say it's a very personal journey um if you feel this and you you feel that you're missing this reconnecting to it and rediscovering it is an extremely powerful tool and um i mean you you can even go as far as to say that if if if you feel then a, a spirituality about it then there can be even that um that element now 
what I'd I'd like to do as well is also talk uh, to, to the people who are in the room as well. I acknowledge that there are a couple of people here on this call, and um, and I'm going to allow you to to talk actually this time. So I'm just going to click on that now. And what we'll, what we'll do is we can we can sort of talk about questions that you may have about um, about this topic, but also about languages in general. I mean, the Polyglot Conference, the, the the whole goal is to is to sort of celebrate everyone who loves language, and and to to talk about all topics related to language as well. I mean, language is the the one thing really that unifies us all and makes us all. Um, sort of human, <laughs> I guess, right? So uh, I do see other people writing on, on YouTube. Um, I actually can open that today, which is amazing. Um, so I can also interact with you on YouTube too. Um, I will do my very, very best to, to keep ahead, up with things. And, um, and so, yes. So um, let me just see, does anybody want to talk from if you want to talk from uh, the room, just raise your hand and um, feel free to then come off mic and ask a, ask a question. Or if you want to comment on something to do with this, please feel free and uh, you'll be very welcome to do that. Now, now I see some comments here about um, expecting the stream to be at a different time. Yeah, and I apologize. But for, for that, it's um, it's completely on me. <laughs> I I really planned to be around at, at six p.m. But um, Central European time is normal, but it just wasn't possible, and it felt most logical to choose six p.m. in the local time where I knew I definitely would be free. Um, yeah, but whilst I'm organising the political conference this week, well, this next couple of weeks. There's um, there's an awful lot of work to do uh, in, in doing that and putting together an event of this size with this many moving parts is is quite the task. So, um, you know, I, I I like to make sure that we we make sure we we, we meet with all the people that we need to meet with and uh, organize all the things we need to have in place ready to welcome people. So, so yes, that's why. Um, I have a question from Mohammed about learning more than one language at once. And should you do that? Um, so learning multiple languages at the same time is completely possible. Uh, there are people who, who really think it's a good idea and there are people who really think it's a bad idea. So you're gonna hear lots and lots of opinions on this type of thing with learning multiple languages. Now, look, I, I could never say no to this <laughs> because this is something I've done. Uh, all the way through my language learning process, including at university. So, at university, my my my degree is in um, combined languages, which meant that I had to study a minimum of three languages for my degree, and then I actually took four languages, and I sat in on another language language related degree, actually Scandinavian studies degree, at the same time in parallel with my main degree. So. Uh, one time I, I, I was studying around five languages at university and going to the lessons related to those languages. And, and I came out and used those, all of those languages professionally for my work. Uh, those languages at university were French, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, and Swedish. And I, I, I've used all five of them for, for work at various stages um, for over many, many years. Now. Um, then I also did Old Icelandic. So obviously I, you can't work in Old Icelandic and I was only doing translations. But yes, you can study more than one language, whether it's in an academic setting like I did or whether you're doing it on your own. And um, the only thing I would say when it comes to studying multiple languages is you've got to think about how much time you have and you've got to think about how much, not just the time you have to study, but also the thinking time that you have for the language. So if you're studying, for example, some very different languages to the ones you already speak, let's say, I don't know, you speak Spanish and English and you're learning Japanese and 
Greenland deck, they're going to be wildly different, and you're not going to have a base on which to sort of just quickly build up vocabulary. So you need to actually focus quite a lot on that. So sometimes what I would often suggest is that you take a language that's what one one way of doing this actually there are a few ways of doing this one way of doing it would be to take one language that's similar to a language or languages that you already speak so you feel a quicker progress through the language to be able to start communicating and then the second one could be a language that's further removed from the languages you speak and so it's kind of a, a longer burn uh, for for learning that's one one way of doing it the other thing that some people do and um elisa polese is uh, a wonderful person and a great language learner in the community. In fact, she and I had a chat during the Polyglot Conference uh, Global, and and she actually practices this with students. She actually takes students through learning, and I, I think like up to even ten languages. I mean, like large numbers of languages at one time. And she says she finds it works, and I think it depends on which ones you're doing and. What you're doing them how you're doing it and how you're managing it so it can work and you can even do more than one or two if you really want to you do have to ask yourself though why you're doing it and um, i think this is the the really important thing are you learning are you learning languages because it's a number or are you learning because you really want those particular languages so if you want those particular languages because of some relationships friendships um some connection in some way then then it can definitely work and um yeah i would absolutely advise you to have a look at elisa polese uh, she's on youtube she's also on instagram um so elisa e-l-i-s-a and polese p-o-l-e-s-e -E, elisa polese so yeah have a look and see if you can find her you'll be able to find her quite easily she's fairly googleable um, as i say lovely person with uh, some really good ideas as well okay good now richard i hope it's good it's good dear good heart yeah thank you yeah me gets good thank you it's a bit of a warm heart it's a bit of so ein bisschen rot geworden, so von der Sonne. Aber ja, ansonsten, ja, es geht, es geht mir gut, danke. Um, I can say that it's incredibly helpful to start off with one language until it's a point where you can immerse with native content without too much struggle and then add another one if you want. Yes, um, so I, so Stefan, that would definitely be another, another way of doing it. So making sure you get to a point where you feel comfortable in the first language and taking another language. Completely valid way of doing it too. Um, there are so many different ways, and I think it depends on your depends on your, your workload. It depends on how much time you've got to dedicate to language learning. It depends on um, how slowly or fast you want to or need to go. And so, yeah, absolutely. Okay. I've been considering learning Polish. My worry is that my Russian, uh, that my Russian that I have studied for five years will be po oh, polified and vice versa. Um, Jonas, it, it can happen. I'm not going to pretend it can't happen. It can happen. Um, it's not necessarily the end of the world um, because that can actually be a temporary effect of learning a new Slavic language. So with Slavic languages, many languages that are related, it, if you focus your energy into learning a new Slavic language, you're gonna to have to make shortcuts quite quickly if you studied one before. Um, what happens is that your brain is focused so much on the differences because you're, you're learning differences as opposed to new stuff very often in many of these, many of that learning that you're doing with, with a new Slavic language. So what happens is that because your brain is focused so much on it, it will then transpose some of that onto the language that you already speak. Now, that can also ebb away. It can sort of, it doesn't need to stay that way. It's just what, what happens. And it's because of the amount of time and energy you're using to get the language in your head. Um, and it can balance out eventually. 
it, it doesn't necessarily stay that way. So it's worth trying it, seeing how you feel. Um, I, I'm not going to pretend that there aren't people who have an experience where they end up speaking neither one nor the other as they would like. Now, you've got to ask yourself the question how, how much you can put up with some mixing. And also, some people I, I, I meet as well will, will often never speak one of the languages because they're too similar. And that, that does happen. So I'm not going to pretend it doesn't happen. It does. I've met people who have had that issue and um, some of them were okay with it. Some of them were not. Some of them then stopped one of them and just kept it as a passive language, carried on with the other language that they preferred speaking or felt was stronger um, and, and sort of distilled that language and made it more just that language. So definitely consider trying it if you are interested in doing it and seeing how you get on and then monitor how, how you feel as it goes. But it, it, it does, it does balance. It takes time, but it, it normally balances out. Any advice for perseverance through boredom? Oh yeah. Boredom's a killer. It's really, so yeah, if you, I mean, if you're bored and you, you recognize you're bored, it's, it's, it's problematic. Um, so Thomas, if, if you're bored, you need to analyze why you're bored. Because boredom isn't just boredom, it's, it's why am I bored? Why, why am I doing this? Um, I know it sounds a bit weird, but it, it, it's true. It's like, the, it's not just, you're not just bored because you're bored, you're bored because of many things. So it could be that the, what you're doing is just not, engaging or exciting for you the type of learning materials you're using the type of things that you're engaging with in the language are not exciting so you you just you, you switch off and that's completely understandable and possible uh, so i i think the first thing is to make sure that you yeah you you find things that are engaging but you can also become bored with the language um simply because uh, you, you, you've either got too many other things going on or you're overstimulated or understimulated in other areas uh, of your life and, and you need that downtime of doing nothing or sometimes. And so you almost, yeah, feel lethargic in that kind of boredom. Um, so it, it really depends on, on what the boredom is and why it's there. So I would analyze that first and if you know what that is, feel free to write it in the comments. If you know why you're bored. Um, okay. So I don't see any hands up in my live chat. I'm very happy if you do have a question to come up from using to talk. But um, otherwise, I will read some more of the comments from, from YouTube. Okay. Abroad. Should I speak English rather than my target language if understanding every detail is important to me? Or should I accept the challenge? I feel shy to speak in some situations. Wow, Sebastian, that's a, a really good question. Um, so I'm going to answer your question with a question. Is how important is it for you to learn target language? And what kind of level do you want to attain? If it is important, then you need to go through a real pain barrier in speaking the language. I mean, you're not going to be able to express yourself as you do in, in your case here, English, in your target language right away. And even when you learn a language to a very high level, you're not going to express yourself in the same exactly the same way because the languages don't always allow for you to do that so say for example my home language macedonian and my first language english uh, there are things that i cannot say in macedonian just because the language doesn't allow for it uh, likewise there are things i can't say in english that i can say in macedonian because the language doesn't allow for it um so you feel almost, it, it's very weird when you start hitting the boundaries of a language as well. But to get to the point where you feel the boundaries of a language, you need to go through quite a lot of pain barriers 
to first of all um, feel comfortable expressing yourself in a way that's not exactly the level of detail that you'd want but does get the message across and so the first important thing for you to do is to distill the message that you really want to um, carry over to somebody else to communicate and there's kind of a piece that you have to make with that there's a what's the important thing what's the message can i say the message first of all and worry about the kind of making it flowery later because if we try and put the detail in before we can actually get the message across in a very confident manner what happens is we get so lost in the detail that the message becomes garbled and unintelligible to the to the person you're talking to and it ends up just becoming a jumbled mess basically so i've i've heard i've been at, even i've heard people do this before in in many languages where they'll be fixing or fixating should i say on a way that they would want to say it in their first language or a language they used to speaking more often and then because they're so fixated on it they end up not really saying much of anything in the other language because what comes out makes no sense it makes very little sense because there'll be cultural references linguistic references that, that don't belong in that language um, and so language learning isn't just I, I know it sounds a bit crazy but it's not it's not just learning words and grammar um, it comes down to a lot of learning because a language is a, a vehicle for culture right so if i use the same words even let me take english for an example but if i use the same english that i use from the uk and i use it in the united states it has a different weight power meaning context completely and if i were to speak using the same words and grammar that i use in this English, even if I were to try with an American accent. Still, the connotations and all of the links are related to the UK. And so they don't make sense, if that, if that makes sense to you. And so when you go to a completely different language with very different traditions as well, um, this just like, goes crazy so you're never going to be able to speak the same way you do in english anyway so i'd say you need to accept that let go of it and start redefining the parameters where you are happy and starting from core message and then start adding on the layers of the detail that are then appropriate to that language's culture I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Long answer to that question, but it's actually a really good question. Um, Cause it's, it's one I think that, actually I was speaking a little bit about language and somebody asked me last week about cultural and linguistic appropriation. And that's possibly one where I've seen people try to use a language and ignore the culture completely. And I'm not, I don't know if it's completely linguistic appropriation or cultural appropriation or, or cultural unawareness. And the, the jury's out for me on that because um, I think the intention is really important as well. And I think it is difficult to get a grasp of that sometimes. But um, this is kind of where that, that line in the sand, we're getting close to it, where, where we, where we do have expectations to be able to use the language on our terms and not on the terms of the linguistic community. So really, really interesting question. Yeah. And I know if you feel shy, it can make it a little bit more complicated, right? So um, I'm not going to say to you and patronize you by saying, oh, you know, don't be shy, just be brave. That's nonsense. You have to do it on your terms. I mean, if you feel shy, um, you also need to consider how it's actually manageable for you to, to do that. And 
what what is acceptable for you in how you feel and how you are as a person. I, I'm a great believer in authenticity and being authentic to yourself. And if you don't feel you can be authentic to yourself, then it's definitely not the same type of experience. So yeah, absolutely. Um, authenticity over everything else, uh, always. And then, you know, when it comes to sort of how you communicate. So finding where you feel comfortable is important. As well. Oh, wow. Now is our turn to experience being on the wrong time zone for your live stream as well. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, yeah, I, it's a funny time, isn't it? But I guess uh, it feels OK for me because it's it's what time now? Half past six in the evening here in Mexico. But yeah, it's I thought it would be a bit of a weird thing. Testen orsken din, sammen, som en som har lært seg hele verdens språk, følger du at det er hele tatt er mulig at opprettholde alle, eller er det bare et visst antall språk man kan holde fisk om gangen, gjør det altså bare jag sa antal språk som man har frisk i huvudet det är omöjligt att att snacka alla språk uh, samtidigt ja för mig men orsken uh, för exempel är det ja är det är det är det för svensk uh, men uh, men ja jag snackar norsk ja uh, jag förstår uh, gott men um, men jag att, att snacka bra, eh, för exempel ja, ja det, det är det är inte så så möjligt. Snacka alla språken så um, ja, um, jag, jag vill säga jättebra, men ja, det är så svenskt. <laughs> uh, ja, det är så, ja, men det är vanskligt. Det är vanskligt att snacka alla språk uh, perfekt eller ja. Um, ja, bra, trevligt, men uh, ja. Nice question. Ja, det är fint. Ja, tack Jonas. Um, Something that helps me is imagining the roles reversed and how I feel when somebody makes a big effort to try to speak one of my languages to me. It always feels positive. Can't imagine being judgy. No, Stefan, this is an interesting thing. Um, the question of, of um, some of these questions that we have online, uh, like the term cultural appropriation, one of the things that I really appreciate about the United States is American English in particular is extremely in, in, innovative in defining terms to express certain things or phenomena, for example, like yeah, cultural appropriation. It's not a term that I ever hear in many other places or coming out of many other places. I hear it a lot from people from the US and possibly Canada, um, but from North America. It's a North American English term. And I would say mostly the States. So I find it useful to have this, this type of terminology to be able to talk about this, because I think it is important to talk about it. I mean, the United States is a country of, what, 350 million people? It's like a lot of people. Um, and and so, I mean, you know, it's not an insignificant number of people who, who have strong feelings about certain things that they see and perceive and live through and experience. And so pretending that doesn't exist is not quite right in my mind. Um, but also what I find really interesting is exactly what you've just said about you, you can't imagine this, like being judged about somebody who's speaking language. And I think for the vast majority of people that I speak to, it would be very much the same kind of feeling expressed. Um, and the, there can be on the basis of some of this, another expression in US American, as US American English uh, would be 
the idea of um, virtue signaling, for example. And it's another useful expression because you, you do see a lot of that out of the US, for example. People will virtue signal, they will take offense on, sometimes people will take offense on behalf of another community when that community doesn't necessarily feel offended. And it can come under virtue signaling where they're trying to show themselves as being overly aware of sometimes an issue that for a community doesn't even exist. So it's a, it's a super, super interesting um, set of, of, of, of, of terminology. And I, I actually really appreciate the US for, for, for bring, coming up with these kinds of things. It may not even come from the US. I mean, I'm saying that, but it's the US that uses it most that I see. Um, it does get used in the UK more and more. Uh, and uh, and I, I, I, I wouldn't be able to say as a general rule for Australian, New Zealand English, but I think it does that too. Um, from what I remember from interactions online, I, I do see, see it come up. But in the US, it's particularly prevalent. Um, but what I don't see sometimes strangely is this trying to actually understand the mindset of the people when attributing all of these things to. So talking about cultural linguistic appropriation and talking about virtue signaling and talking about offensive, what's offensive, what isn't offensive, out of the context of the community we're choosing to attribute those terms to is problematic. And this relates to language and cultural uh, topics for me because I see it happen very often that, that often there will be overextended. So something that's offensive in the US particularly may not be in, in South Africa or in Australia or in New Zealand or in the UK or in name any other, I mean, I'm naming countries that speak a lot of English, right? But other, other countries as well outside of the English speaking world. But it's quite interesting to see how, how all of that comes together and sort of, and, and also I see a lot of people um, fighting over these things online. I find it particularly interesting um, to see how, that's, how that plays out. Um, yeah, I mean, no, I don't really judge any of it. I just think it's, it's, it's kind of, I, I sort, of, sort of observe it and then sort of try and, try and digest what I see and what I perceive. Um, you know, I've, uh, I've spent time in in a number of different places where English is spoken. I mean, I've spent I spent a month in Canada, uh, in Quebec. I spent uh, I spent time in Australia. Spent time in South Africa, and uh, in the US, I've travelled and spent some time as well. Um, so, I've experienced a number of different English language communities where actually they are quite different in a number of ways and yeah so yeah thank you for, for sharing that uh got me thinking <laughs> about all the things i've been trying to digest um it's weird if you speak spanish from spain spanish grammar and mexican accents spain spanish grammar is easier for me and the mexican pronunciation oh it's interesting okay yeah i th there are certain things i mean being in mexico i'm gonna I'm going to share with you there are certain words that i can't really use here that are in my natural spanish and i have to stop myself and use mexican spanish word one of them is popote because if i use the word that i would normally use people have a very strong reaction so i can't i can't use it so i i i adopted the word for, this is a word for straw in, in in mexican spanish popote or one of the words for straw but i adopted it very quickly because using the word that I normally use, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a no-no. So yeah. Um, oh, totally. I meant to address feeling too shy and nervous to speak. I think cultural appropriation and respect is something we need to be aware of and sensitive about. Yeah, Stephen, absolutely. Yeah, feeling nervous to speak. I think it's doing it in finding maybe circles that you feel confident in, as well as one way of, of sort of taking that on. Um, you know, sort of talking to, finding people you can you can sort of find a community, sort of a, a feeling of camaraderie with, can maybe help. But I think this is something that you need to 
experience and explore in your own terms as well. Okay. Hey, Magali, nice to see you. Um, how can we, as teachers of foreign languages, encourage someone that has a lot of fear to speak their target language with others? Okay, so fear of speaking and not know. So fear of speaking actually can lead to the issue of not knowing what to talk about and sort of stopping because we don't have anything to talk about, right? I think practicing certain phrases that you can you can get feel comfortable with that are useful and can be reused in different contexts is really, really key. So working on certain types of dialogues, for example, and making sure you practice them until you feel very comfortable with them and then adding to them and changing them for words or types of grammar that you want to explore. So for example, um, okay, today I, went to uh i went to watch uh, a ceremony here in cholula um, there were lots of people dressed in their indigenous costumes from around mexico uh, but particularly from this part of mexico and it was extremely moving now i could start talking about that and talk more about that experience right and what we could do with the teacher is start to build out a dialogue where I, I need to know certain words to be able to express what I saw how I felt those kinds of things and then it can be a practice of using those words and expressions so fitting it together so that it makes a conversation a dialogue, well, even even parts of it, even a monologue, right? Because certain parts of it, you're going to want to express an entire thing that happened. And then um, starting to make comparisons or asking questions to the other person about, have you seen anything like that before yourself? Have you experienced this kind of thing? Have you done this thing yourself? Have you been to that place? So, um, and then even the referencing things that you've done in the past or things that you want to do in the future that are related to the same thing, using similar vocabulary again, but allow you to explore more topics in a more natural conversational way. Because conversation is like that. Conversation, we'll talk, we'll talk about a topic and then we'll move the topic on, but we'll also talk about things that happen, things that are going to happen. And to be able to do that, you need to have a core set of vocabulary and types of things you're going to say feel comfortable with and will then be able to manipulate so that's kind of where I, I i would go with that with with with people who are nervous about speaking in the beginning um people who you want to encourage to speak you've got to give them the blocks to use and then show them how to move the blocks around but the, the blocks of language Uh, okay, I'm shocked, by the way, any Scandinavian language is fine speaking with Norwegians. It's just like dialects to us, really. What do you think about the fact that Hollywood has a monopoly? I feel it's harmful for a monolingual world and creating interest for not only English speaking cultures, but others. Um, yes, yeah, so you're not, first of all, I'm, I'm glad. Yeah, I'm glad you're shocked in a positive way about me reading your Norwegian and I hope it was understandable as I pronounced it. I, I, I imagine it's a lot more Swedish, Swedishified than, than it was when I first started learning it. But yeah, I mean, I, I studied Swedish at university and I also uh, studied through Swedish at university in Sweden. So these languages are not um, particularly alien to me. Um, and, and yes, of course, I mean, I, I used to go to Norway all the time and and just speak Swedish. And I, I never had an issue with people speaking to me in Norwegian and me speaking in Swedish. Um, what do I think about the films and stuff being in English? Yeah, I mean, there are other, other countries that, that produce them. The, the issue with English is, is, I mean, okay, that there are advantages to having a language that many people learn and then we'll use as an intermediary language to speak. So 
the advantages for many people are quite clear. Um, I learn my language and then I learn English, or I learn them both at the same time even, and then I use English to communicate internationally. And that's kind of the way the world's gone over the last few generations. As an English speaker, as someone who grew up uh, going through an English education system, um, for many people uh, who speak English, it's a, it's a benefit for travel because they can travel. They become very privileged because they are able to speak the language without even thinking about it. But it's quite harmful in that um, if you're trying to teach a language at a school in in an English speaking country, it can be very difficult to express why it's even important. And you don't need to do that if you're learning English in any other country, because people will often have foreigners arrive and the default language will often be English uh, or they will travel abroad and they will need to use a default language to communicate and that's often English. Not always, but it's often. Um, so that's kind of the, the good and bad of it as an international language. The, the issue is that look, if, if, if we experience everything through an auxiliary language that's not quite the language of the other country, it's never gonna be the same. So, like me going to, for example, let, let's just even take your country, Jonas. Like if I go to Norway and I don't speak any Norwegian and don't understand Norwegian, yeah, I mean, I can go there and it's, have a nice time and it's fun and people are lovely and they'll speak to me in English and they'll speak very good English in, Nor in Norway. But it is quite different when you speak to people in Norwegian in Norway. And some of the jokes that you'll make, because Norwegians, you tend to make jokes based on wordplay as well. So um, sometimes, even if you don't get it straight away, if you're learning Norwegian, that can be explained and you have a context. And uh, I mean, you can answer this for me too, Jonas. Do you feel closer to somebody who's, who you know understands your language and can, and can speak to you in your terms? Because I think it comes down to the individual to do that and to make the effort. And I, I think a monolingual world is a very sad world. It's, it was not just monolingual, it's monochrome. I mean, it's one color. It's, it's not, uh, as, you know, English is a beautiful language. I'm not gonna pretend that I don't think English is beautiful. I think it really is. It's an extremely rich language. It's, it contains many different elements in it from many different languages. It's a very accepting language of um, different accents, different variations, different uh, grammatical differences within the different Englishes around the world and also the vocabulary it takes on. It has languages, you know, lang words from languages from all sorts of places. You know, not every language does that. Not every language is that forgiving of, or accepting of, of other words. And I think that's one of the, probably one of the strengths of English and um, why it, it, it works so well. The, but a, a monolingual world would be a very sad world. And I, I hope we, we don't go down that road. Um, I mean, tragically, I think in Europe, we are going down a road of, instead of people speaking three or four languages, they're learning their language in English. This has consequences as well, because you have areas of Europe and other parts of the world, but I can talk mostly about Europe, where it can actually help to reduce ethnic tensions in a weird way, because when the youth, for example, I can talk about the Balkans, the youth can use English as an intermediary language and there's no, there's no power struggle with English. It's both of them, for both parties, it's, it's English. It's not, it, it's, it's not a language that has a kind of a dog in the race. So, whereas when you learn the other side's language, some, I, I, I still believe it's good for both sides to learn the languages, but it can be difficult in terms of a power dynamic. And so English can actually be, strangely, um, 
<laughs> I know it sounds really weird to say this. It can be a language of peace. <laughs> I, don't, I didn't think I'd ever say that, but yeah, it can. It can actually do that. So I see kids, for example, that speak one of the Slavic languages spoken in former Yugoslavia, speaking with Albanian speaking kids, and they just communicate in English. And I've seen that happen more and more over the last 10 or 15 years. And it's it's a huge change, huge change. Um, whereas, yeah, I mean, the ability of, of uh, I mean, of Albanian speakers in, uh, in former Yugoslav republics and, and areas speaking the Slavic language is, is definitely less and less. Um, there's no doubt about it. And uh, how comfortable they are speaking it is definitely less and less. Uh, but, but then they're communicating in English a lot more. So uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, the, the, on the one, heart, one hand, English can be quite harmful in that way. On the other hand, it's kind of helps to, to smooth out some, some quite difficult things. Um, but in Europe, I mean, the European Union's plan was to have people learn at least three languages, to not just learn English in their own language, but to learn the neighbor's language or something else. And I don't know how it's going to play out. I guess it's all, we'll have to wait and see. But I really don't think that, um, for many reasons, a monolingual world is, is a particularly desirable thing. Uh, I think when you, when you experience the world through different languages and different lenses, you have a very different understanding of how things are. Um, okay, I see there's some other questions. Okay, I agree, it's really interesting and worth thinking about. I do have quite a li little energy for people who always seem to be offended on someone else's behalf, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it can almost be, it can almost be in um, kind of a, an obsession for some for some people, I think, I, particularly on the internet, like being offended for people. I don't even know if that comes and can kind of come under virtual signaling, I guess. But sometimes I also see people sort of telling people that they're virtue signaling on behalf of another community. And yeah, I mean, I, I find that a little bit, I think, it's up to the community to decide what they think is appropriate and not appropriate and then educate I, I think i'm i'm more for a positive thing instead of like pointing the finger at everyone all the time I, it's just my my way of doing things i, I don't see the world and i think it's, it's better to teach and learn than than to just point the finger and blame and so you know, I, I, I did see some very interesting uh examples of this actually uh, in yeah on, on on TikTok recently speaking about you know the things that we're seeing coming out of Iran and um and the videos that we're seeing and and, and people doing or putting things out there in in support of, of of those protesting and then people saying that they're virtue signaling because they just want the views for it and then you have somebody actually from Iran who says that they don't care if they're virtue signaling or if that's what you want to label it. Actually, what they care about is they want the support. So it's it's super interesting to see the layers um, of, of this whole dynamic of, yeah, offense, virtue signaling, and and how it's used and what it's used for. So, so yeah, I, I've, I've been very, I'm very interested in following these kinds of discussions. Um, okay. Sen Kazakhcha, Kazakhcha, Bilsen there. Um, so I understand what you've asked me. <laughs> do you, do you understand Kazakh? Um, I can understand it because Sen is like, Sen in Turkish, uh, Kazakhcha is Kazakh, Kazakhcha in Turkish, uh, Bilsen is Biliyor, biliyor musun? Be is also, uh, we use, we use this actually, this be in Macedonian too. I, I love, I love these, these Turkish words, um, Turkic words that we have. Um, 
And the answer to the question is, I understand some Kazakh, clearly because I've studied Turkish and I've studied a little bit of Azeri, but Turkish mainly. I have books for Kazakh and I would love to speak it at some point. I went to Kazakhstan, I went to Almaty and visited um, a friend of mine there, called Amir, um, many, many years ago uh, when they got rid of the visa for, for UK passport holders. And I absolutely loved um, Almaty. I thought that the people were so friendly and so kind and genuinely interested in in me, talking to me and getting to know me. And I, you know, as a human being, you, you, we kind of think for many of us, we like that contact and we like that curiosity. So it's, I, I found that particularly uh, endearing and and I, I I've always said I want to go back and haven't yet. And I'd love to learn. Whilst I was in Almaty, no, I didn't speak any Kazakh because I, I couldn't and I still can't. I can understand some things that I read and things that I hear sometimes because it's a Turkic language. Um, particularly simple things like this that you've written. I mean, that's not, not, not particularly hard for me to understand, but maybe even other things I could possibly understand too. Um, but when I was there in Almaty, I actually spoke Russian uh, a lot. Uh, many people, there were kind of a mix of people speaking Kazakh and Russian, but I spoke Russian because many people could speak it. And that was like the lingua franca for me in, in Kazakhstan. Um, it was also the lingua franca in Bishkek, but people weren't as excited about speaking to me in Bishkek, <laughs> um, particularly in Russian, I don't know. Maybe it was that, but um, but yeah, it was it was interesting. Uh, but I, I would love to go back to Kazakhstan. Um, it really is. It's, it's a great place. Okay. Uh, yes, Kazakh shares a lot of lots of words with Turkish because they're both Turkish languages. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so I mean, I I would like to. I would like to. It's probably if I were to learn another Turkic language, it would probably be Kazakh actually. That I would like to learn. I've got books and courses for Kyrgyz, a Kazakh, and I've got some materials for Azeri. Azeri is quite strange because I do understand it pretty well um, because it's it's it's that much closer to, to Turkish. Um, but I think Kazakh would probably be the one that I'd like to learn, uh, just because, like, in terms of order of which ones, unless something drastic happens and another one comes up but yeah I would, I would I've always said that I'd like to learn Kazakh so maybe maybe I can do it one day uh oh wow okay uh send Kyrgyz cha alas alas I don't <laughs> so I don't I my, I don't understand Kyrgyz as well as Kazakh, but um, I, I, I, I've been there and I, I, I enjoyed my time in, in Kyrgyzstan. And I was only in Bishkek and only for a few days. But um, yeah, I, as I say, I bought a book. But I can, I can read certain things because, it, again, it's Turkic language and, it, and you write in, um, in Cyrillic. So my home language, Macedonian, is written in Cyrillic. And, and so I'm very used to reading Cyrillic letters, even though you've got different letters. Um, I, I, I know the letters fairly well. So, um, so yeah, it's almost like Kazakh. It is, it, it, it feels a bit, a bit further removed for me than from Turkish. Maybe because I saw more Kazakh and maybe I came into contact more with Kazakh. I didn't come into contact with Kyrgyz as much. So it's it's not as familiar to me, and I haven't yeah I haven't studied either of them much particularly, but they're yeah, both both languages are absolutely an option. Um, but I think I would probably go with Kazakh because I've got I've got friends there and um, I've got more more connections there. But um, I mean, look, who knows? <laughs> Maybe even Kyrgyz as well. As I say, I've got a book for it. I bought I bought a Kyrgyz book when I was there. I always buy these language books and I, I tend to buy them when I, I really enjoy the place and I like hearing the language and I have a positive experience. I tend to buy 
the language book. So we'll see. Who knows? You have to run, unfortunately, Stephen. Okay, well, it was nice to see you. Thank you for joining, Stefan. Um, unfortunately, but thanks very much for doing this, Richard. You're a big inspiration, both as a language learner and as a human being. Thank you. Oh, that's very sweet. Thank you. Thank you. To be honest, I think I would be able to connect with people speaking English since we tend to speak it well. However, I see your point. Easier to become my best friend speaking Norwegian because uh, no need to translate yet. Yeah, you're not, I mean, English is, I, I look, people get married through a language that's not either of the partners, right? Um, first language and they meet, and I've, I've met many people who do this through English. So I'm absolutely, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm absolutely convinced that people have very meaningful relationships during this day, absolutely zero, um, zero doubt in my mind. But I mean, <laughs> I think there are a lot more things going on when it's like a relationship like that. And sometimes even friendships, it can be, it can be very close through another language. I just think that as an individual, when you experience a country through a language, it's it's quite powerful. So I've met people who have lived in in countries where they they live for a number of years, they they get by in English, it's absolutely fine. They have good friends, they have good relationships, but there are certain things about the culture that just they never seem to really get, and it's because they don't speak the language. Um, because. What language does is it actually, uh, so the language is kind of a lens as well. So when, when, you, when you speak a language, you also, you, you're consuming the culture as well very often. And so things that I experience through English or through Macedonian or through French or through Spanish or through whatever, they're through a lens. So it, it, it does have an impact um, for, for the person learning and speaking and as a foreigner in the place, but also for the people there, because there are certain things that you, there are certain topics that you won't even talk about necessarily and won't even think you think you're talking about everything, but then there are certain things that you won't talk about because it, it, it's it's outside of the linguistic context. And I, I know that for for example, for me too, if I if I'm to speak to, I would speak differently to an to someone from the United, like someone who's learning American English, or someone from the US. They're not necessarily going to have the same cultural references, even as someone from the UK, unless they spent time in the UK and. I'm going to avoid certain topics, not not not to be mean or not to exclude them, but just because as soon as you speak in a, in a different way, even if it's between different Englishes, I know, for example, someone from someone who speaks Australian English will understand a lot more of the cultural references from the UK way more quickly and way more easily than someone from the US, for example. They just do. They, they they because they consume more media from the UK than people in the US. I think it's changed a lot in recent years. I think you people in the US are a lot more aware of the UK than they were, but previously they absolutely weren't. Um, I mean, you got very very little stuff from the US, the UK, in the US before. It was very very niche. Uh, but um, yeah, it's it's an interesting topic actually. Uh, I'm almost like Kazakh and Turkish, and for me, I understand both very well. Okay. Turkins, oldukça iyi sanırım. Sanırım evva iyice. Çünkü ben Üsküp'te Türkçe konuşuyorum. Ve bu yüzden Türkçe, Türkçe'm çok fena değil. İyice. Ben artık bir kadar öğrendim. Evet, o zaman... Evet, konuşabilirim. Ama ama Türk değilim değil. <gülüyor> ama evet, evet, konuşuyorum. Yani. <gülüyor> ama Üsküp'te başka başka kelimelerimiz var. 
Evet, dobro dobro konuşuyorsun. <gülüyor> i̇yi, dobro, iyi konuşuyorsun değil mi? Yani çok ilginç ve evet. evet, zaman zaman çok ilginç gramerimiz var. Evet, ama ama iyi bir bir şey. Ve Özgürt'te bana göre üçüncü dildir. Ve birinci Makedonca değil mi? Ama bundan sonra Arnavutça ve Arnavutça'dan sonra e, Türkçe, Türkçe ile Üsküp'te çok iyi ve çok bu problemsiz e, yaşabilirsin. Yani çünkü her zaman Türkçe o bak, e, Türkçeden e, Makedonca'dan altı bin kelime var. Çok kelime değil mi? Ve, um, ve bu yüzden her zaman sürekli insanlar Türkçe ya da anabilir uh, ya da konuşabilir. Evet. Let me see. Okay. Are there any questions from I see a question in here. Oh, there are questions. I haven't seen the questions. You're very welcome to come off mute, actually, if you want to, and, and ask the questions in person. It would be nice to hear your voice. If you don't, if you if you if you if you don't want to, then I understand, because we are live online as well. So I get I get it. Might not be, but you're very welcome to. Um, one second, I'll just try and read your questions out. Just make them a little bit bigger because the comments here are crazy. Uh, in it's crazy small. Okay. So Taya asked me. Okay, let me see if I can just uh, make this a little bit. Okay, here we go. One second, bear with me. Okay. Following up with what you said before, do you ever experience insomnia or kind of fever dreams where you, when you're learning a difficult language? kind of another kind of overstimulation oh right yeah so sometimes yeah the, the um the language i might have a dream and something clicks or something happens in the language because it's basically dominant in my head so dreams may well be um in or partly in a language absolutely and that can sometimes wake me up um absolutely so So for sure that happens. Um, and it's to do with how much time I'm spending on the language as well. So particularly if I'm learning a language very intensively, like I did the the Estonian challenge last year, I was definitely thinking a lot about Estonian <laughs> and, and dreaming a lot about Estonian and Estonia and my time there. And all of a sudden conversations were happening in Estonian in my head. And it was super cool, but yeah, sometimes overstimulation, but but in a good way, in a good way. Um, and then your second thing that you've asked here, or you've mentioned here, Theo, is I think people conflate in, in sense, insensitivity and being offensive. And they also don't get the difference between ignorance and willful ignorance. Fear of the unknown or just plain racist, hateful xenophobia. Yep. Sometimes it is that. It sometimes it really is. And um, I mean, I I agree with you that you know, I've I've definitely come across people who who will say things that maybe may, may even be may even be offensive, right? But it doesn't necessarily come from a bad place. It comes from a place of not knowing. And I think I I prefer to. I prefer to see if if, if there's an op, of a learning opportunity when it comes to this type of thing before jumping to the they're doing it out of other nefarious reasons. Um, so, so yeah, I mean maybe that's just me, but I mean I'm kind of a the optimist, and I I hope that the people, or at least I like to give people the chance to correct themselves. I think. In a world where people are very quick to get a camera out and start recording somebody 
and and have it all over sort of have it all over the internet which i find problematic sometimes sometimes it's good because it, it can particularly you know there are there i'm not like everything's got good and bad in it right I mean, everything but yeah a lot of things have good and bad in it <laughs> um but i'm yeah. much prefer no, that was that, that was really helpful, Richard. I, I think sometimes it's also just like people in nowadays they want to be against something instead of for something. So it's it's very easy to jump on, you know, pile on and whatever issue it is. But yeah, and yeah, thank you so much. Are you you're really welcome. I mean, and thanks for coming on on voice as well. I really appreciate you talking. Um, um, it, it it is very problematic. I mean, I think the U.S. particularly is going through uh, the recent years quite a lot of discussion and debate and sometimes quite a lot of quite violent confrontation, whether that's violence, a physical violence or actually um, verbal violence on a lot of these issues. So this is a very hot topic in the US in particular. And, and I know um, there's a lot of sensitivity around the whole discussion, um, let alone the actual content. So I'm very conscious of all of that. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I think at the moment we're in, we're in kind of a very stormy place uh, when it comes to content we see from the US, particularly on these types of topics. Uh, but yeah, I mean, look, there are important topics to go through and to talk about and to, to deal with. And yeah how we deal with them and how we actually deal with them in a positive way and move forward and learn from them, and learn how to deal with them, I think is, is actually even more important um, uh, because they, the things that we go through, kind of the pains that we go through as societies, communities, and I think we need to, to see where we, where it leads us, right? If it's, we, we would all hope, I guess, that we want to see a positive outcome I think as communities, there is a desire to, to have a positive or, and or peaceful outcome. And agreeing on what that is, is kind of, I guess, the pain. Uh, and how we get there, I guess, is the pain. And the words we use to define it is the pain as well for, for many people, because they can be, you know, as again, trigger words for people that words words that are used with an intention and words that are received with a different interpretation or different connotation or different cultural context or different experience behind them uh, the all of these things sort of go into the whole part really yeah i mean i think also like some people are, are not nearly as as obviously uh, you know sensitive to the kind of interpersonal com uh, communication as you are in the sense of like you know seeing how a message is received as well as as whether well, you know whether they're correctly giving the message or whatever and and and obviously uh it's that's uh kind of can get more feedback that way and better able to judge the situation i would think um mm -hmm. yeah i mean i i tend to be quite quiet when it comes to these kinds of arguments disputes and things and I, I just give my impressions as how I see them uh, during, if I have a conversation with somebody or, I mean, I'm happy to talk about these things online, but I don't tend to get involved in the, the, the disputes. I, I don't think that's particularly useful and productive. Um, but I hope that what I do observe and rings true for, for people across the spectrum, wherever they sit on these kinds of discussions, that there's something that you can sort of see a thread of, okay, yeah, there is something in there that I can identify with. And I think that's part of the human experience. And it's kind of brings me nicely round to, to how I started this whole life. And that is being here in Mexico and just talking to local people about issues that are important to me, that are also important to them, that they don't often get to talk about or talk about for whatever reason and how the whole discussion and the whole thing about languages and identity and culture can bridge the gap between someone who's flown 
you know, halfway around the world from Europe to a place where I have no uh, cultural or family ties or connections. And we can still meet and agree and talk and have a really meaningful interaction and and feel like we get each other. There's something quite powerful about that. And, um, and I think that's what language and, and language awareness and culture and cultural awareness, I think that's the power that it has. There's something really important about, you know, distilling a message, even when it's not a language you're learning, you're even in your own language, right? Distilling a message to its core points, focusing on what's important for you, where you're going from, and then seeing how that matches up with other people. And very often to these kinds of things, I find that we're pulling in the same direction. And uh, it's very positive. Anyway, I've been here for over an hour, so I suppose I should disappear. It was so, so nice to see you all. And thank you for coming and keeping me company and for talking about language and culture. I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, so next week I should be around as well from Mexico a week after I won't because I'll be at the conference. And um, I look forward to speaking to you all very soon. Take care and 